shouting on the hills of glory. I do believe there's going to be some shouting when reunion takes place. And I believe there's going to be some shouting when glory is revealed. Shouting. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Proverbs, chapter 22 with me tonight. Mother's Day is coming up Sunday. And I thought tonight I might talk about something that's relative to that. Psalm 22 and verse 6. It's a very familiar scripture. You all have... Uh, no doubt many times been to that text. Psalm 20, uh, Proverbs 22, verse 6. The scripture says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Father, bless your holy word tonight now, and I pray that you'd anoint the messenger as the word goes forth. In thy name I pray, amen. Now, this training up a child is very important to the Hebrew. The Apostle Paul said, Timothy, 2 Timothy 1.5, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Then in 2 Timothy 3.15 he said, And from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. These Jews, first century Jews, who believe their Bible, the Tanakh, the Old Testament, we call it, they don't call it that, but they call it the Tanakh, that believed that, had no problem accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as the Messiah. There was no contradiction whatsoever in believing that the Lord Jesus is the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter number 53, and Psalm 22, and, uh, and uh, Isaiah chapter number 40, no problem. No problem at all. The problem, the thing that keeps a Jew today from being saved is what's called rabbinic Judaism. Rabbinic Judaism is based upon an occult reading and understanding of the Bible, and it's based upon tradition, as I've told you in Sunday school before, that was handed down, they say, from Sinai, that when God gave Moses the law, he gave him two laws. He gave him the written law, which you have in your hand, the Torah, but he also gave him an oral law. The oral law, they say, takes precedent over the written law. And the oral law became the basis for what we know today as the Babylonian Talmud. And that oral law is what the Lord referred to 2,000 years ago when he said, you've made the word of God of none effect by your traditions. So when Paul said, Timothy, from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise into salvation, he's talking about the Old Testament. He's not talking about Judaism. He's not talking about Judaism. He's talking about the Old Testament. He's talking about the Scriptures. He's talking about men like Nathaniel, who said, the Lord Jesus said, uh, an, an Israelite indeed in whom, in whom is no guile. An Israelite, one who believed the Bible. But this is very important to understand because his mother and his grandmother raised him up to understand the Scriptures because they were so very important. They had great respect for the scriptures. The Jews today wear phylacteries, little boxes, one on the forehead and on their arms. It has portions of the scriptures. On their houses, they had what's called a mezuzah. The mezuzah had portions of the scriptures. Every time they entered or left that house, they were, making, they were acknowledging that the scripture was going with them and watching over them. So to the Jew, the scripture is very important. And, and, and for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons, according to the book of Romans, chapter number 9, to them was given the oracles of God. They were the ones God gave the responsibility to keep God's word, and they did. They did. They did. No question about that. They kept it for you. So the Old Testament text that you have in your hand is the same text that you find in that 57-foot-long scroll of Isaiah that's in the dome of the book over there in Jerusalem. Essentially the same thing. And that dates back to about 250 to 300 B.C., 400 years from its original autograph. The book of Isaiah was written about 700 B.C. You're only looking at about four to 500 years between that and the copy that they had from, at Qumran, and there's no difference. And the book you have in your hand, that Isaiah that you've got in your Old Testament, no difference from it either. So God preserved his word, didn't he? Amen. He preserved it. Why inspire it if you're not going to preserve it? 
So when you raise up a child in the fear and the admonition of the Lord, you're doing the most, the most important thing that you can do for that child. Here's what Harry Ironside, Ironside said about the scripture. He said, to start the child right is of all importance. The saying of the Jesuit, give me your child till he is 12 and I care not who has charge of him afterwards, has passed into a proverb. The tree follows the bent of its early years and so with our sons and daughters. If taught to love the world, to crave its fashions and follies in childhood, they're almost certain to live for the world when they come to mature years. On the other hand, if properly instructed as to the vanity of all that men of this present evil age live for from the beginning, they are in little danger of reversing that judgment as they grow older. Parents need to remember it is not enough to tell their little ones of Jesus and his rejection or to warn them of the ways of the world, but they must see to it that in their own lives they live exempl they, they exemplify their instruction. That exemplify simply means that they become an example of what they are teaching. It's not going to work to tell them one thing out of one side of your mouth and live another thing before them. That's hypocrisy, and kids will pick up on it in a heartbeat. They will. And that will make null and void all that you're trying to teach them. It's very important, very important that you teach your children. I didn't get any of that instruction. I've told you time and time and time again. My grandfather gave me a place to live, gave me a home, and I'm indebted to him and thank him for that for the rest of my life. But as far as personal instruction in building of character and instruction in Scripture and things of that nature, it did not exist in my life. God has had to teach me since I got saved in 1973. He has become my father and he has taught me his way, the things that make a person's character, the things that build, uh, the build that inside you and build Christ in you that the work of the Holy Spirit does. And Lord knows, my friend tonight, believe me, I am a far cry from what I was when I got saved in 1973. I'm not yet where I should be, but I'm a long way from where I was. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah to God for that. Today. In California... There's a lady out there. It's a school teacher. I've been corresponding with her now. I mentioned her to you the other day in the message. I think it was Sunday morning. This lady lives. She grew up in San Francisco. She's a school teacher. She sent me another letter a couple of days ago. And uh, it's quite remarkable what she had to say. Listen to this. She says, I use the public libraries in San Francisco quite a bit because I'm a preschool teacher. I often check out the children's section of the library to find interesting books which I can share with my students. In January, I picked up a public library booklet entitled, We Love Diverse Books. Now hold on to that. Get a hold of that title. A number of readings and workshops were listed for children and youths. What caught my eye was Drag Queen Story Hour. The listing read, Join us for a unique and unforgettable story hour featuring face painting and cookies in partnership with Radar Publications. She enclosed a photocopy of the story hour listing with my letter. I looked, radar, I looked up RadarPublications.org to find out about this nonprofit organization. On its site, it describes the story hour as such, Drag Queen Story Hour is exactly what you think. Local drag queens reading stories to children in libraries and schools. Drag Queen Story Hour captures the imagination and play of the gender fluidity in childhood and gives kids glamorous, positive, and unabashedly queer role models. In spaces like this, kids are able to see people who defy rigid gender restrictions and imagine a world where people can present as they wish, where dress up is real. The photographs show grown men in classrooms dressed up as women wearing full makeup and wigs. Drag queens always present themselves as very exaggerated imitations or caricatures of women. Now, you know, someone say it may be comical on one hand what, how they appear, but on the other hand, they're going after your children. And that is, that is the sinister part of it. They're going to recruit your children. It's not a matter of leave me alone, bigot, and allow me to, to live my life as I please, bigot. Uh, it's not a matter of that. It's a matter of I want your kids. 
and I'm going to indoctrinate them into my lifestyle. That's what's been going on in this country. That's what's happening right now under the nose of the people who apparently are fast asleep inside most of the church houses in the country. That's a shame. They, big bu they build big buildings and they have great uh, for performances and presentations and they have the beautiful this and the beautiful that while their kids are being sucked off into a damnable lifestyle like that. They have nothing to boast about. The church in America has nothing to be proud of. It has nothing to project itself before the world for. It ought to be ashamed of itself for allowing it even to happen. And of course, I'm, I'm, I'm branded now with title. titles. This is a generation spoon-fed society. It's no longer critical thinking people who can, can consider the, you know, who can look at both sides of an issue and come to a logical conclusion. Conclusion. They're spoon-fed. How are they spoon-fed? Titles. Once you brand somebody bigot, racist, homophobe, uh, misogynist, and, and on and on and on it goes, then you've branded them and shut them out from that moment on. See how it works? That's what's happened in this country. That's exactly what's happened in America. And the churches wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. But the bottom line is we're losing our children. Do you think it's right to let a drag queen come into a classroom or a public library, you know, and read to little children? It's not right. They have no right to do that. You notice there was nothing said about Christians coming in there reading from the Bible. Not a word. See how it works? This all-inclusive, this uh, tolerant uh, crowd, they're the ones who bust out the windows and burn cars down. They're fascist. They're not tolerant. They're, 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 they're fascist. And when they talk to me about how I don't want to offend anyone and I'm so tired of, you know, people using rough and crude language and, and, you know, we need to be good to each other and blah, blah, blah. Why don't you quit killing your babies? When you stop killing your babies, then I'll start listening to you as if you really mean what you're talking about about compassion. You don't understand what compassion and mercy is. You don't have a clue what the word means. A child in its mother's womb should be the safest place in America. It should be. You know, the ancient Hebrews had quite a, a love for their children. Alfred Edersheim, in some of his work, talks about the upbringing of Jewish children. And uh, I've quoted this to you in time past, but I want to read it for you again today. The upbringing of Jewish children. The tenderness of the bond which united Jewish parents to their children appears even in the multiplicity and pictorialness of the expressions by which the various stages of child life are designated in the Hebrew. Besides such general words as ben and bath and son and daughter, we find no fewer than nine different terms, each depicting a fresh stage of life. Tell me. They are watching their children as they change and grow. The first of these simply designates the baby as the newly born, the yaled, or in the feminine, yalda, as in Exodus 2, 3, 6, and 8. The use of this term throws fresh light on the meaning of some passages of Scripture. Thus we remember that it is applied to our Lord in the prophecy of his birth, Isaiah 9, 6. For a babe, yaled, is born unto us, a son, ben, is given to us. While in Isaiah 2, 6, that employment adds a new meaning to the charge, they please themselves or strike hands with the yalda, the babes of strangers, marking them, so to speak, as not only the children of strangers, but as unholy from their very birth. Now you understand, then, what's going on here. They know that there is a vast difference between a newborn child, a babe, a babe, and as it continues to grow, the next name change, next child name, point of time, is Yonic, which means literally a suckling, being also sometimes used figurative, figuratively of plants, like our English sucker, as in Isaiah 53, 2. He shall grow up before him as a sucker, or as a, as a Yonic, as a root out of a dry ground. The word Yonic occurs, for example, in Isaiah 11, 8 and in Psalm 8, 2. On the other hand, the expression in later passages 
rendered babes in our authorized version makes a yet third stage in the child's existence and a farther advancement in the babe life. This appears from many passages as the word implies the olel is still sucking, but it is no longer satisfied with only its nourishment and is asking bread. As in Lamentation 4.4, 4, the tongue of the yonek cleaves to the roof of his mouth for thirst. The olalem asks for bread. <clears throat> a fourth designation represents a child as a gamul or weaned one. Psalm 131, 2, Isaiah 11, 8, 28, 9. From a verb which primarily means to complete and secondarily to wean. As we know, the period of weaning among the Hebrews was generally at the end of two years and was celebrated by a feast, celebrating the growth of, the, of that child. After that, the fond eye of the Hebrew parent seems to watch the child as it is clinging to its mother, as it were ranging itself by her. Whence the fifth designation, Toph, Esther 3.13. The Toph and the woman in one day, Jeremiah 40, verse 7, Ezekiel 9, 6. The sixth period is marked by the word Elam in the feminine Alma in Isaiah 7.14 of the Virgin Mother, which, become, which denotes becoming firm and strong. As one might expect, we have next the Naar, or youth, literally he who shakes off or shakes himself free. Lastly, we find the child designated as Bakur, or the ripened one. A young warrior is in Isaiah 31, 8, and Jeremiah 18, 6, 18, 21, rather, and 15, 8. Assuredly, those who so keenly watched child life as to give a pictorial designation to each advancing stage of its existence must have been fondly attached to their children. So the Apostle Paul says again, From a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise into salvation. What's that all that mean? It means that the Jews loved their children. That's what it meant. It is unnatural not to. If you don't love your children and say you love everybody else, you've got a problem somewhere. Something's not working right here. <laughs> Something's not working right. Something's not working right. Gears aren't meshing right. Something's wrong. It is natural for the children to love their parents. That's just as natural as it can be. For a child to love its mother and to love its father is natural. That's the way it ought to be. That's what God put in the heart of these children. So the bottom line is that there is a bond, an indissoluble bond as it should be, between a parent and their children. They should be brought together and joined in a bond, in unity. One loves the other, the other loves the other. In love, children loves their parents, parents love their children. With that kind of bond that makes up for what's called a home with a mother and a father and their children, you've got the foundation for a society, for a civil society. Anything else is a jungle. When the man no longer has a family and a, and a, and a wife and, a, and children to protect and defend, that man is just footloose and fancy free and owes nothing to anything. And that's exactly what these new world revisionist and social changers are working toward is to break down the family structure. That's one of the ways they break it down. Another way they break it down is to redefine the family structure. Men marrying men and women marrying women. Let me say something to you. It doesn't make any difference how many people wave their hands over Bibles or, or, or take oaths or, or swear uh, whatever, they, whatever they say in their so-called weddings. There is no such thing as a man marrying a man and a woman marrying a woman. It does not exist. It doesn't make any difference if the state recognizes it as a legal marriage. That's irrelevant. The state is not the one who joins together. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And believe me, God does not join male to male and female to female. It does not work. It is a, it is, the Bible calls it confusion. And it's confusion. It's a perversion. So when Mother's Day comes up this coming Sunday, there will be some mothers going around that you're not sure if they're male or female. <laughs> you know, you don't. You're getting to the point now where you don't know what you're looking at. And uh, androgyny, I've told you before what that is, that's just a big word, simply means that they're changing the gender identity of the people in this country. Have you noticed, have you noticed 
that it seems like that the floodgates have opened with all of these people now, little children, little children. Did you know that they are giving drugs to three and four and five-year-old children to help them cope with their new gender identity? You understand what you're dealing with? You understand the powers that be that are doing this? These people need to be in an insane asylum. Amen. They're giving children three and four and five years old drugs to help them, uh, help them come to deal with their gender identity. When did you ever see a three-year-old that's concerned about its gender? It's only because it's been brainwashed. It's been its little life has been has been invaded. You've got drag queens reading to them. They're going after your children. If you lose your children, I don't care about your boat and your house and your car and your bank account. I don't care about your 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 traditions. I don't care about what you've accomplished in this and that. You know. The world would look at you and say, I built this huge business. I've built all this. I've got all this money. I'm, you know, I'm a successful businessman. Where are your children? Where are your children? We don't all bet 100%. The Bible talks about a rebellious son. Bring him to the gate of the city. It's a hard thing to imagine doing that and have him stoned to death. These are the kind of people who were so, so very, very, very uh, into raising their family right that they couldn't stand the thought of a rebellious son. They couldn't stand that thought. To them, it had to be that that child had not only rebelled against them, but it rebelled against God. And such a thing was just simply incompatible in their mind. So a mother... And a father is the gift from God. Now, if you had a good mother and a good father, then you were taught firsthand. You have a primary source. You don't have to read books about what a good mother and a good father ought to be because you've got that. You've had that. You've had that. And that's a blessing. And you don't realize it when you're a kid, when you're a child. Most of them don't. Most kids are angry because mom and dad tell them what to do and how to do it and this and that and so forth. So when they get older, they're going to join the Marine Corps when nobody's going to tell them what to do. <laughs> <laughs> ha -ha. Are they in for a wake-up call? <laughs> and believe me, or the army, or the navy, the air, any of them, any of the military services, they say, "Ain't nobody gonna tell me what to do." Aren't right, you waiting, for you, big boy? <laughs> you join up, you'll find out. Somebody's gonna tell you what to do. You'll find out fast. But you see, the point is that the rebellion is natural to a child. It's natural to all of us, and that rebellion has to be removed. One man gives some of the points that are so necessary to teach children. And I thought it was pretty good, so I'd mention it to you tonight. Here are some of the points. He said, you need, you need to teach a child how to do things for themselves. Independence. You need, to, you, need to have, you need to teach a child how to do what they'll say they'll do. Dependability. You need to teach children how to get along with others. Cooperation. You need to teach children how to solve problems without yelling and hitting. Problem-solving skills. And you need to teach children how to do well in school. That's academic skills. You need to learn how to learn. Did you get that? You need to learn how to learn. Because if once you ever get to a point in life, you'll be able to teach yourself. Once you reach a certain point, to where you know how to read and research, you'll educate yourself. And that's a good point to be. That's a good place to be. That's a good place to be. Where you get to the point to where you don't run around and say, well, nobody ever showed me or nobody ever told me. Folks, you need to get to the point where you learn how to think for yourself. Critical thinking. Here are the three things that this man said. He said, teach your children to think independently. Now, that's good. Do you know what that means? That means that if the crowd's headed this way, stop and think for a minute. Where's that crowd going? My experience has been most of the time the crowd's wrong. It is. The crowd is wrong. You need to teach your children how to be critical thinkers. So what does that mean? A critical thinker is a person who can take this side of the argument 
that side of the argument, sit down and look at both sides of the argument, and he should be read, well read enough to make some kind of a decision based on information, not emotion. If you live your life and all of your choices and decisions are made about how you feel, you're going to get in trouble. You're going to get in trouble big time. Emotion should be the last thing involved. You should be making your decisions based on what you've experienced, what you've learned, all of this after you've done some praying and do some critical thinking. I think to myself, why do most preachers in America not get up and talk about the stuff I'm talking about? You may tell you why? Because of their belly. Their God is their belly. They don't want to rock the boat. They don't do anything in their churches that might cause them to lose some people. Why? They want more people. Why do they want more people? So they can build bigger buildings. Why do they want to build bigger buildings? So they can get more people. It goes this way. It's a cycle. And then so the day will come when they can go out and say, Look at all the buildings we've built. Well, I see your buildings. One day they're going to crumble. <laughs> How about telling me about the lives that have been built? How about the lives that have really been changed? How about the people that have been rooted and grounded in the faith? How about the people in your congregation who really believe something? What about that? Have you had a hand in that? I'm not interested in somebody's buildings. But anyway, critical thinking. That's critical thinking. I went to a funeral one time, been to many of them, but I hadn't been saved too long. And I preached in that funeral, and there was three preachers, three preachers in that funeral, three of them. And I got up and I preached a little bit about hell. I mentioned to the people, you know, when you die, you're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. <laughs> These other preachers over here, I could see the shock waves moving across. Paul! Oh. I thought, yeah, man, mention something like that in a time like this? And so when we got done there, we were out in the graveyard, and they came up to me and said, we're going to be taking care of the rest of the service. <laughs> That's what they said to me. <laughs> I just got ostracized, <laughs> dissected, <laughs> set aside. <laughs> oh, preacher, did you drop your head down and mind, whine and mourn about No, I didn't. I got back up the next Sunday morning by the grace of God and said, Lord, give me what you want me to preach because I know there's an awful lot of the reverends out there and then, that's all they care about, the dollar bill. One of them, when I went into his office, he had a big photograph of himself on the wall, and it was like this. <laughs> One of these jobs. I'll never forget that. I got a terrible memory. I really do, but some things, boy, they burn. And, I thought, good night, son. You must think an awful lot of yourself. <laughs> you know, kids graduate from high school. Wouldn't it be something if I gave them an eight by 10 photograph of me? Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> redefine narcissism. <laughs> but that goes on, believe me, that goes on. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the greatest preacher of them all? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's funny and it's a joke, it's joking, but, it, but the truth of the matter is it's true. <laughs> yes, sir. What did the poor old Lord do before we showed up? You know it. Isn't that the truth? That's what some of them think. Amen. What did I do before he showed up in my life? That's what matters. <laughs> and then finally, provide the environment for them to create original thought. When's the last time you heard an original statement about anything? Think about it. And this original, if it's good, it'll come from God. It's called revelation. <laughs> and there's nothing like it. It'll beat you, boy. I mean, there's nothing. There's nothing like it. And then finally, how to live godly and righteously in this world. Spirituality. That's what you should be teaching your children. You teach them how to do that. You teach them that these things that we're talking about are real and they are going to affect the way you live and they're eternal and they're going to be just as good 30 years from now as they are tonight. Yeah. Amen, folks. This is God's eternal word. This pop culture that you're part of right now in America is popped up overnight and it'll die just like it started. Amen. Folks, if the Lord doesn't come back a hundred years from now, this may, may be nothing but a wasted wilderness. That's right. Washington, D.C. leveled to the ground. 
through a nuclear war and nothing left here. But this old book right here, it'll still be around. Why? Because the word of God endures forever. Hallelujah. That's a wonderful book. That book will get you right or mess you up. If you try to use it, twist the scriptures, you'll twist it to your own destruction. That's what it says. But if you'll believe it and read it, it'll change your life. Everybody's hiding behind Elmer Gantry out there. How many of you know who I'm talking about, Elmer Gantry? Most of you don't, then. This younger generation doesn't know about Elmer Gantry. Elmer Gantry was a notorious, fake, hypocrite preacher. And they made a movie about him. And that movie, I guess, 40, 50 years ago, sometime back in there. And, I mean, he was the epitome of, of hypocrisy, Elmer Gantry. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are hiding behind some preacher. They're hiding behind some deacon. They're hiding behind, behind some full, full soul that fell. And, uh, you know, they're, they justify themselves over somebody else's loss or ashes or whatever. That's not going to get you anywhere. That'll get you nowhere. Well, I'll close with this one tonight. I'm going to give you seven, wa eight ways to be a stupid parent. That'd be a good thing to close on, right? <laughs> eight ways to be a stupid parent. <laughs> Discipline your children only when you lose your temper, when you're mad. Let them get away with anything until you're fed up. Then in a spirit of hostility and anger, let them have it. Blow your top, holler, get wild, clobber them. Really make a brawl out of it. The children will get a bang out of you. They will. <laughs> Number two, don't make yourself approachable. You might have to listen and reason with them. If you get too chummy, they'll want to talk things over with you. And who's got time to waste with kids? You've got more important things to do. Number three, if they've done wrong, never let them forget it. Keep rubbing it in. They'll loathe you for it. Number four. Now here we're talking about how to be a stupid parent. Number four. Give your child all the spending money he wants. Don't make him earn it. Money in large quantities is an acceptable substitute for love. After a while, he'll want only your money and couldn't care less about you. It's something like starving him on cream puffs. Number five, compare your child with someone else to make him smarten up. Use that beautiful expression. Why can't you be like Johnny? He'll despise you and Johnny both. Number six, mother and father should disagree in regard to the rules of their youngsters right in front of the kids. Children will then learn to play one parent against the other. Kids are smart. They know which one to go to to get what they want. Number seven, never let the kids think for themselves. They haven't the equipment. The reason may be in their heredity or environment. <laughs> you look at your kid and you say, you stupid, dumb thing. That's your kid. <laughs> well, they say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Make all the decisions for them so they'll never be able to handle life. And number eight, finally, treat them with suspicion. Never trust the sneaky little characters. If they turn out well, it won't be your fault. It'll be a miracle of the highest order. Amen. Amen. And uh, you have to get personally involved. You have to raise some kids, too. I don't want somebody to tell me how to raise kids that never raised any. Right? I don't want somebody to tell me how to keep a marriage together that's never been married. No, sir, don't, don't, don't tell me to, how to lay brick if you've never laid any brick. Don't tell me how to do a valve job if you've never jerked a motor out and pulled its heads and taken those valves out and checked the seat and the guides and all that. That's where mechanic talks. If you've never done that, you don't know what a valve job is. You don't get it by reading books. You gotta make, don't tell me how to build and do a carpenter's job till you've worked with a carpenter and watched him make lumber fit. Take a bowed board and pull it around and nail it in. I learned that from Clarence Burris. That's the way it is. You have intellectual idea of how things done, then you have practical application where you learn it yourself. You learn it yourself. We need that tonight, don't we, folks? Do we love our children? I think you do. I think you folks do love your children. 
Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Well, wouldn't it? <laughs> Be gnashing at the teeth, huh? <laughs> God's been good to me, though. I don't look to them for a blessing, and I sure don't look to them for approval. They're irrelevant. As long as I know in my heart that I'm where God wants me to be. That's all that matters, folks, because God's got my life in his hands. I live, I breathe, I die in his hands. If I show up tomorrow on this earth, it's because the good Lord has given me life. Amen. 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 <laughs> brother Fitzpatrick showed me this tonight. He got this from our brother up in, uh, brother, uh, uh, don't it, uh, up in, in uh, Kentucky, uh, Bingham, Brother Bingham, Brother Lloyd Bingham. How many ever heard of him preach? He's a fine preacher. All right. I heard him preaching Sunday, and he was talking about Islam. And he gave him this book, Brother Fitzpatrick back here, The Islamic Strategy to Conquer America. Okay? And it's not a matter of they want to live in their enclave and they want to be in this crowd and just separate themselves. No, sir, that's not it. There's a, there's a strategy going on. They want to convert this country and turn it into... Sh Put, to turn it into a caliphate and put it under Sharia law. And he wants you to see this lady wrote this. Shira Sorko Ram produces the monthly Ma'at's Israel Report, providing a prophetic, political, and spiritual perspective, current events in Israel as a messianic Jew. So this lady is a Jew that believes in our Lord Jesus Christ as her Messiah. And so that makes her my sister. And so if you'd like to get a copy of this thing, you can see it after the service. I'll leave it up here. But he gets this book back. And it's a fine book, so uh, I'll have it up here for you after the service, and you might want to. All right, brother. <laughs> okay. I appreciate that. All right.